All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His assistance and we ask His forgiveness. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ تَعَالَى مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ عَمَالِنَا And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds. مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهِ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهِ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهِ Whosoever Allah guides to Islam, no one can lead astray. And whoever, whoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance, then no one can guide. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of our worship except Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth alone, with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is a servant and his messenger. May Allah exalt his mention, grant him peace, his companions and all those who follow them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. Amma ba'd, as to what follows, I would like to begin this particular lecture this evening with a question that I will pose to the Muslims who are here. And the question is, you may answer audibly, why are we here? Why? Are we here? Anyone? To gain knowledge. To gain knowledge. To guide ourselves. Huh? To guide ourselves. No. I mean yes, but no. Right? To follow Islam. To follow Islam. That's the closest so far. Why are we here meaning in this life? To worship Allah alone. Right? I was hoping no one would say we're here to, you know, listen to the lecture. Because that's obvious. Why are we here? I mean, what is the purpose of life? The purpose of life, as far as the Muslims are concerned, is to establish the worship of Allah, keyword, alone. Right? Because there are people who worship the Creator, along with other objects of worship which they have erected among themselves and given them, you know, divine attributes by which they are, they are worshipped just like the Creator is worshipped. But the distinction which Islam has and Muslims have as opposed to the rest is the fact that Allah is alone to be worshipped and no one can be worshipped with Allah under any circumstances. This is relevant to the topic of tonight because of this fact. The purpose of life has to do with shirk undercover. And you maybe thought to yourself, uh, please, if the children can be uh, silent, you probably asked yourself, what is shirk undercover? What does it mean? Shirk is, in some definitions, a partner. Like you have a sharik at work, he's your partner at work, right? An equal, in a sense. Uh, undercover, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is one who, something that is working or happening secretly. Something that is working or happening secretly. So then the question is, how can shirk work secretly? Is it possible that the hugest sin that Allah will never forgive could be, it could be established in one's life in a secretive manner? Is it possible? Indeed. This is why you saw, if you saw the flyer, there was a yummy looking cake, right? If you were hungry, I think, I think we sent it at the wrong time. There was a yummy looking cake that had a slice missing and in there was written shirk undercover. Meaning, the, what is apparent may look attractive, but what is within is corrupt. And shirk is exactly that. So then how can shirk work secretly? This is because as Muslims we understand that shirk which is ascribing partners to Allah. The definition is to ascribe, to make partners with Allah in worship. The reason why it does exist in a secretive manner is because of the fact that shirk in Islam is of two kinds. Right or wrong? Right or wrong? Right. Is there one kind of shirk or more than, more than one kind? There's, there's more than one. The two major ones is shirk al-shirk al-akbar 
major shirk wa shirk al asghar minor shirk the major one is the one that is being utilized by those who have not entered into islam which is the way of life which will lead a person to the hellfire which is a way of life which negates the purpose of life as we mentioned which is to worship allah alone it is regarding that kind of shirk and the other one but particularly this one where all says inna allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha verily allah does not forgive that one worships alongside with him other partners and he forgives whatever is lesser than that to whomever he wills and this is to be understood that if one dies in that condition then one in fact is dying in a state of shirk as a mushrik worshiping others with allah the greatest sin of all times the reason why the people of noah were drowned the reason why the people of ibrahim were 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 tortured by allah and the people of lut and the people of Ad, every single nation that all the people of book recognize were in fact punished due to this very sin that is having others with allah whether they were angels or they were prophets or human beings or idols or statues or trees or the sun or the moon or the fire the object may vary but the reality is the same worshiping others alongside with allah that in a muslim's life cannot happen secret i mean in a secretive manner come on you cannot possibly worship others with allah in this fashion without you knowing that you're committing major shirk then how does the minor shirk work this is the question that we will be tackling this particular evening minor shirk itself is divided into categories that which is apparent and that which is hidden there's apparent minor shirk and there's hidden minor shirk the apparent one is also divided into categories that which has to do with statements and that which has to do with actions examples the apparent shirk having to do with one's statements is that of swearing where people were human beings or muslims in this scenario will swear by other than allah right if you're egyptian i'm not picking on you but among our egyptian brothers this is just a fact right this is very common you hear it when nabi you heard this before when nabi is at the bay you know give me this so when nabi is swearing by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the hadith authentic narration authenticated by sheikh al-albani in uh, tirmidhi the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man halafa bi ghayri allah faqad ashraka aw kafar whoever swears by other than allah he has committed shirk or disbelieved according to the ulama this is minor shirk because the one who is magnified is who allah when you swear you trying to mention the importance of the one you swearing by and anything that is created created is insignificant when compared to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator so then we don't swear by any one but allah say wa rabbil ka'ba not wal ka'ba not by the ka'ba by the lord by the rabb of the ka'ba by allah by my lord and the so on and so forth but to swear by one's mustache right you know you see people swearing with their mustache and people swearing with their mother i swear by my mother and father and so on and so forth this is all shirk that muslims be committing sometimes on daily basis without ever being aware that this is shirk and we must know that even though this is minor shirk it is greater in sin than adultery or theft or anything of this likes because it is shirk it is still categorized as shirk and shirk is the most major sin so don't belittle this this is not something that is okay another expression famous among the lebanese people if you speak it to someone on the phone and say tayyib inshallah i'll talk to you later you right they don't say you know say salam alaykum they don't say wa alaykum salam some that is not everybody you say allah wa nabi ma'ak may allah and his prophet be with you how is that going to how is that going to happen allah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they going to be with me on my journey I mean the ma'iyah of Allah, Allah being with his creation, yes, we don't deny, 
Allah encompasses the creation in His knowledge, in His, in His sight, in His hearing, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's above the throne, above the heavens. However, His, his uh, characteristics and His attributes are unlike that of His creation. So He is with the creation, not in a physical sense. But the Prophet وسلم, He can be with you. Where is He? Where is He, brothers? Right now, where is He? He's in His grave. He's in His grave. Alayhi salatu salam, dead. إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ Allah told him, you are going to die and they are going to die. He is dead. Yes, when you send as salatu salam alayhi, Allah assigned angels that will return his soul so he may return his salam. He's not alive. If you thought he was alive, we are in big trouble. You need to start coming to the Tuesday classes so we could fix our understanding of aqidah. He's not alive. He's not with us. Right, so what happens on you know Mawlid al-Nabawi, when the Sufis you know usually gather to practice this innovation, and suddenly you see everybody get up, they claim that the Messenger of Allah just came in to give him a special you know special visit to them. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Very popular. You may be shocked, but this is a fact. This is shirk. This is a form of shirk that the Muslims commit on daily basis without them being knowledgeable of that. The second kind which has to deal with, uh, deal with statements is willing. You know, a, a person will say, whatever Allah wills and you will. Right? By the will of Allah and yours. I depend on Allah and on you. And so on and so forth. And this in fact is a form of shirk. Yani, uh, a person said to the Prophet ﷺ, مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَشِئْتْ فَقَالَ لَهُ أَجَعَلْتَنِي لِلَّهِ نِدًّا أَجْعَلْتَنِي لِلَّهِ نِدًّا قُلْ بَلْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ He told him صلى الله عليه وسلم Have you made me a rival with Allah? You made me equal to Allah. A man told him Whatever Allah wills and you will. This is who? The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He became upset. He said Have you made me equal with Allah? Rather say whatever Allah wills alone. Alone. So مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ Whatever Allah wills and then you may say, Thumma, then, because the particle then denotes sequence and delay, as opposed to and, which means they are associated with one another. There's a combination. So you may say to someone, whatever Allah wills, then you will, because Allah says, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ And you do not will until Allah, the Lord of the worlds, wills first. So then there's the will of Allah, then the will of the creation. So we don't say, I depend on Allah and on you, whatever Allah wills and you, because of you and Allah, I am, you know, working at this particular place. No, we have to be very accurate in these statements. Whatever Allah wills alone, then whatever Allah allowed among the creation to be a tool for that thing to take place. Are we clear on these issues? So we will never say them again as long as we are alive, inshaAllah ta'ala. Tayyib, actions. Uh, I don't know what, you know, everybody here, depending on your country, you know, this will make a whole nother, you will understand this in a different way than the brother next to you. And similarly, the sisters. Because depending on our countries, we will have our own ways. For instance, in some countries, it's very normal to see a horseshoe. Have you ever seen a horseshoe, you know, hanging on someone's front door? You know, uh, no, good. In, in, in most countries that have horseshoes, this is supposed to be a charm. Good fortune. You put a horseshoe and you're supposed to get some good things going on in the house. Right? Besides the fact that a horse may come one day and ask for a shoe. You know, say, hey, who took my shoe? Hey, this is my shoe over there. But, you know, usually they put it too high for the, for the horse to get it. And they really believe. You know, if you buy a house and you don't have a horseshoe hanging at the front of the door, if your house gets burnt the next day, don't wonder why. Say, you, we told you to put a horseshoe. You took too long. People believe this. Rabbit's foot. Rabbit foot. Maybe you don't know this one. This is far-fetched. Uh, some people, you know, have the sabha, right? And they do a lot of dhikr with it, you know? Subhanallah. Even when he's talking to you. Brother, assalamu alaikum, how are you? How are you doing tasbih and talking to me at the same time? It's very amazing, akhi, how you're able to bring a relation between remembering Allah and having a conversation with another human being, right? This is far-fetched, right? The Muslims back in the days, they didn't do this stuff. When they remembered Allah, they really remembered Allah. And when they were talking to the people, they were talking to the people. There was no walking around, you know, doing tasbih on daily basis without being mindful of Allah. So, 
some people believe that this, this sabha or beads, right? A chain of beads has become blessed. You know, I've been doing dhikr so, for so many years. So they hang it in places where they believe because of the barakah associated with these beads, then, you know, also harm will be avoided, evil will be uh, avoided, and good will come for this person because of the barakah of the beads. Similarly, we have uh, threads, people hanging threads, people hanging, I don't even remember them, rings. Some people wear special rings and amulets. All these, in fact, are forms of shirk. Even the Quran, even buying one of these tiny, you know, tiny little masahif, which require a microscope for you to be able to read the verses, if the verses in there are real, right? And supposedly this is mini Quran. And so they put it in little cloth, hang it with a, a paper a clip or whatever, a safety pin, and they hang it in the, ch the child's shirt. Go out in the wilderness, my son. No train shall harm you or run you over as long as you have the Quran hanging from your shirt. And so people believe, but what happens is when the, when the boy is harmed, then people start wondering what happened. Uh, why did the protection not work? So they start blaming other factors. In fact, this is not the way Islam worked. The majority of the ulama, at least concerning the Quran, are of the opinion that it should not be hung on someone as an amulet, as means of protection. The other things, there's no difference that this is haram and shirk. Hanging anything or believing anything is means of protection, whether uh, deterring any evil or bringing any good or benefit. This is un-Islamic. What do we have instead? We have tawakkul ala Allah. We depend on the Creator who arranges the affairs of the creation in the tiniest detailed fashion. Nothing, not a split second, is independent of Allah's decree and arranging of the affairs. So then, why do we get stuck on created, created beings or other elements when the Creator has already provided us with means to seek protection and attain good. So this is why a Muslim is ever connected with his Lord. This is why a Muslim at the time of need and difficulty, who does he turn to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the time of ease and, and prosperity, who do we turn to and thank? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the believer is always in a connection with his Lord. So we don't get stuck on these created beings. This is from the tricks of the shaitan. So he will, he will make our tawheed deficient. He will weaken our faith in Allah. So we become afraid of jinn and we become afraid of shayateen and we become afraid of spirits and ghosts and everything in the creation. And we're not afraid of the creator. So this must be understood. We don't believe that these things benefit or harm. And it must be noted that if someone believes that these things are causes, these are among the causes that Allah had made, then this is minor shirk. If someone believes that these things themselves benefit or harm, then this is major shirk. If you believe that horseshoe is acting or doing the job of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of protecting your house or bringing goodness to the house, then this is major shirk. But if you believe Allah allowed it to be a reason, even though He didn't, then this is minor shirk. So we have to have that understood, so we, win, we may not fall into that. And this leads us to the real subject matter. The real topic of tonight's lecture. I had to deal with this because this is available and relevant. But what we are talking about tonight in particular is a shirk al khafi Hidden shirk. We said there's apparent shirk. And we divided that into the categories that we have. Now we have hidden shirk, where someone does it secretly, and, but it's unlike the first. It's different in many ways. First, well, let's quote a hadith from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. He said, خَرَجَ عَلَيْنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَنَحْنُ نَتَذَاكَرَ الْمَسِيحَ الدَّجَّالِ he said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out. They were sitting in a masjid and he came to them while they were discussing Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. Who is the Masih Al-Dajjal? The false Messiah. The one that will come towards the end of time, claim that he is Jesus or he will claim that he is God. He will claim that he is Allah. He will perform miracles. Then Jesus Alayhi Salatu Salam, as we Muslims believe, will return and he will kill him. Jesus, peace be upon him. Right? So Al-Masih al-Dajjal, they were discussing him because every prophet warned his nation 
from Al Masih al Dajjal. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to them, "Ala ukhbirukum bima huwa akhwafu alaykum indi min al Masih al Dajjal." He said to them, "Shall I not inform you of that which I fear more concerning you than the Masih al Dajjal?" قالوا بلى. They said yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said a shirk al khafi, hidden shirk. Then he explained it. أن يقوم الرجل ليصلي فيزين صلاته لما يرى من نظر أو بالمعنى من نظر الرجال أو الناس إليه. He said, it is a man, there is hidden shirk. When a man stands up for salah, then he will beautify his prayer because he sees other others looking at him, right? So usually at home, you know, Speedy Gonzalez, you know who that is? You know, the Ariba Ariba guy always running around fast, right? Salah, you know, Allahu Akbar, before you, before you do the dua al istiftah, he's in ruku'ah. Before, his, before he stand, he's in ruku'ah, he's up to Jude, you know. I call it usually what? The police are chasing me, Salah. Right? The police are chasing me, meaning I'm on the run from the police. I better get these two rak'ah in, you know, in 15 seconds before I'm arrested and go to jail. The last two rak'ahs of my life in the, in the you know, freedom. So we pray this prayer of a silly individual who should be ashamed of Allah to stand and pray in front of Allah doing exercise or gymnastics. So and at home, like that. In the masjid, Shaykh al-Islam, right? In the masjid, you know, everything is just, just, just perfect. Why? Not because he's trying to please Allah. Because the people are looking now, right? We got to make him happy. This kind of shirk is a disaster, right? This will destroy a believer. This will destroy the deed. And this will get us farther away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the shaitan works in a number of ways. His main objective ultimately is that we remain away from the path of Allah, right? Go to Jahannam with your evil deeds. Forget about Jannah, it's not for you. If he's unable to do so, and Allah decreed that we shall be guided because we strove, right? Not because, because of anything, because we strove for the hidayah, and Allah granted, us, granted that to us out of mercy and grace, then the shaitan will try to take you to Jahannam through hidayah, where he will twist your intentions. This is why Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya said, the shirk al-Khafi, this kind of shirk, is, is the most commonly spread. It is a sea without a coast. Very few do not drown. Very few do not drown in it. It's the shirk of intentions and desires. So the da'iyah, first he begins the da'wah for the sake of Allah, right? And the shaitan is upset now. This guy is not only not following me, not only he's going against me, I keep telling him to abandon the sunnah, and he keeps adhering to the sunnah. Okay, now I will make his following the sunnah for the sake of the people, not for the sake of Allah. And either way, he won. You see what I'm saying? So this is dangerous. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. That we need to be very, very accurate in our intentions. Every single time we're involved in da'wah, we must be mindful of Allah. Every time you enjoin what is good, forbid what is evil, do salah, zakah, hajj, it should be for the sake of Allah. Nothing else. Once something else is associated, is destroyed. Pay attention. If you do it for the sake of the creation, this is shirk, major shirk. If you do it for Allah's sake, and for some other objectives which we will elaborate on in a, in a little bit insha'Allah, then we have fallen into that same danger zone. And that deed will not be accepted by Allah. And the shaitan is victorious over us. So when we are guided, brothers and sisters in Islam, then we have to have our guards up concerning that, that element of a shirk al-khafi, the hidden shirk. Insha'Allah, I will try to give us some breakdown. So we will know the various means and the protection, how to protect ourselves from this particular thing. But before I continue, or I will postpone it for a while, then you will hear something quite strange. The hidden shirk, a shirk al khafi, is also divided into categories. First is sum'a. Sum'a. Sum'a comes from which word? Sam'a. Yes, ma. Okay? Reputation. Having a good, fantastic reputation. So one form of hidden shirk is one would like to be heard by others. 
He wants his seat, as they call it, his reputation, to make it all the way across. Now again, if the intention is to give da'wah for the sake of Allah, and the intention is clean, alhamdulillah. If you believe that you're conveying the truth and the sunnah, and you want to reach out to the audience, the Muslim world, alhamdulillah. We're talking about the one who has the, the intention of fame and recognition. Doesn't matter whether the people, you know, are following the sunnah or not, as long as he is viewed by, you know, many people. This is called sum'ah, reputation to be heard. And this is a, a common disease among the qurra, those who recite the Qur'an, right? This is how the shaitan will destroy them. So then this person, while leading the salah, right, his main objective is that the people behind him are pleased with his melodious recitation. This is why you will find in the first rak'ah, the fatiha is quite long. In the third rak'ah, before you say, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, he's making ruku'ah. What happened? Wasn't it for the sake of Allah in the first rak'ah? If it was this, for the sake of Allah in the third rak'ah, then it should be the same. If you were making it sound nice, if you were stopping at the end of the ayat, because Allah is responding to you in the first rak'ah, what is stopping you to do this in the third rak'ah? Because the people don't hear you anymore? So now it doesn't matter. Then Alhamdulillah Rabbil Amin, Rahman Rahim, Maliki, Umdeen, Yalla. Why? This is how they are trapped. And the Qur'an in general, the shayateen, wal-iyadhu billah, try to destroy them by making their intention for reputation. They want to be known and recognized among the masses that they are wonderful Qur'an and they are destroyed consequently. So then if, you're, if you have a beautiful voice, Barakallah Feek, then make sure that when you recite, your intention is to please Allah with the voice He gave you. And that the people feel affection of the Qur'an. The, the Qur'an affects them. Not that you as an individual will affect them. It should be the words of Allah and not the words of the creation. Or the statements of the creation or the actions of the creation. Uh, the second kind is the famous one, the most famous one or the infamous one is Ar-Riya. Now notice, Sama' is from, uh, Sum'a is from Sama' and Riya is from Ra'a. To view, to behold, to see. And Riya is basically showing off. Doing things to show off. And this can be materialized in many different ways. First of which is the riya of the body. One's physical being. So you find an individual, right, who's fasting on Monday. And he is trying to look pale. Trying to look tired. His eyes are sinking. He could barely speak. You know, not in Ramadan. In Ramadan, maybe, you know, he has no choice. Right? Some people get really that tired in Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. We're talking about a voluntary fast. He wants you to ask him, brother, what's wrong with you? Right? He's just sitting there. When is he going to ask me, man? What's wrong with me? I'm so tired. <laughs> brother, what's wrong? Oh, brother, alhamdulillah, I'm fasting. Barakallah feek. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. This is exactly what the shaitan wants. Sufyan ibn Thawri, I believe, or Ibn Uyayna, one of them, both of them were mashayikh. He said, it was narrated to me, that the son of Adam will do an act of worship, seeking Allah's pleasure. Then the shaitan will remain after him until he, until he publicizes that deed, right? He will continue to fight with him until, make it public, let the people know about it. And then after he does that, he will continue to fight with him until he seeks to be praised for that deed. And he said, once that occurs, that deed is scratched off the list of good deeds and is written with the, in the book of Riyah. It becomes showing off. The whole fasting is for the sake of that individual, no longer for the sake of Allah. Because it was, Allah was intended along with someone else. And the hadith of Abu Hurairah in Sahih Muslim, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Man ashraka, man amila amalan, ashraka fihi ma'i ghayri, taraktahu wa shirka. Whoever does a deed whereby he ascribes or associates others in worship with me, I will abandon him and his shirk. He will, Allah will not accept unless it is 100% pure for the sake of Allah. Now there are some minor exceptions that the ulama mentioned. We will deal with that accordingly inshallah. But for now, the body, huh, looking tired and so on and so forth. The second kind is that of the outward appearance. Right? So one, will wear the dress code of the scholars and the ulama. 
right? They, in some countries, now alhamdulillah here usually the alim looks like the same as everybody else with the exception of the mishlah, which is all right. But in other countries, they have a special garb. You know, the ulama, they wear this kind of similar to the Catholics, actually, uh, the closest to the, the, the Christians. Uh, and this is a special, you know, with a white little thing and a red thread, you know, uh, or feather that is hanging from their, uh, whatever, imama, supposedly. This is a special dress code for the ulama. So one who doesn't know anything, you know, who puts, he puts it on, you know, walks down the street. You know, I'm, so the people think, oh, mashallah, this is a alim, even though he's not. Others go to the other extreme. They wear the worst of clothing. He's a zahid, right? He's, he's an ascetic. The dunya, unimportant. And so he's trying to, do, I mean, it's okay if the person's aniya was, was sincere. He really doesn't care for the dunya. We're talking about the one who does it for the people to say, look at this brother, man, he does not care for the dunya. Masha'Allah, Masha'Allah. And the worst of those is when one goes to a store, carpet store, and he buys the roughest carpet they have. And he, intend, he, with, 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 yani he intends to make a lot of sujood on it until he gets this mark on his forehead. Huh? You know the mark? That little mark that some people get by the will of Allah, right? This is not the one that is simahum fi wujuhim, as many people think. That, you know, the, the, the sign, the, the light of the believers in their face. It is not some, you know, rough skin that you have on your forehead, as the ulama have mentioned. If you have it, I'm not mad at you. Okay, I'm not saying that you have done this as riya. Some people just get it because of the nature of the skin. It's a matter of skin at the end of the day. Some people like it. Say this person looks like he's a you know, very righteous person because of these two dots or whatever he has. So he gets a rough carpet and he continues to do it until he gets something similar. So when the people see him, they say, MashaAllah, this brother must be doing qiyam all night. Otherwise, where did he get this from? The carpet in the masjid is too soft to give you that. You see what I'm saying? I hope you don't have these things, man. That's why you're laughing. No, but in fact, people do this. If, if this is, look, if the ulama suffered with their niya, then what about the common folks? The students of knowledge suffer with their intentions. What about the regular people? Many people, this is very normal. He does not see this as a disease in any way, shape or form. This is ma'lish. You know, this is the way things work. So you meet a person who will tell you everything he does from good deeds. And you just wonder, Akhi, are you serious? They will tell you everything. I did this and I did that for 20 years. I've been doing this for blah, blah, blah. This information is between you and Allah. Why are you telling me what you've done? I mean, if you're trying to encourage me because you're a big sheikh and your intentions are sound, alhamdulillah, but usually it's common people who don't know any better and just try to show off to others what they have done. So this is very dangerous. It's to be left alone. This is the outward appearance. Thirdly, speech, right? The person will be sitting like this. As soon as people look at him, <laughs> he wasn't remembering Allah just moments ago. But now when we're looking at him, you know, I'm remembering Allah now. So then they, they, they do this. Or people learn, seek knowledge, not so they can worship Allah better, but say, so they can argue with the opponents better. So they learn little intricate details that no one knows. No one knows, you know, except a few. And they will use this to show in front of the people when they're there that they know, mashallah, they have all this, you know, detailed knowledge. Now again, I'm speaking about the people with wrong intentions. It doesn't mean that everyone who's doing this is already wrong. Some people are sincere to Allah and everything we mention is not applicable to them, right? I'm speaking about individuals with the wrong diseased intentions. Otherwise, having knowledge is wonderful. Having detailed knowledge is even more wonderful. As long as the intention is what? To, to protect ourselves from Allah's punishment. To worship Allah according to the knowledge and to convey it to the people. But if people seek it for the entertainment purposes, or for just to, to sound fancy, then we're in trouble again. The Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, مَن تَعَلَّمَ عِلْمًا مِمَّا يُبْتَغَ بِهِ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ لا يتعلمه إلا ليصيب به عرضا من الدنيا لم يجد ريح الجنة يوم القيامة. Whosoever acquires knowledge by which Allah's face should be sought, it should be only for the sake of Allah. But he only learns it so he may he, he may acquire some worldly gain. He shall not smell the fragrance of Jannah on the day of judgment. Not smell the fragrance of Jannah. Person seeking knowledge, 
spending hours at home writing and reviewing and so on and so forth. But with this wicked intention, trying to gain a dunya with the knowledge, they will, not they will not smell the fragrance of Jannah, let alone enter Jannah. So you see how dangerous shirk is. The list goes on. The shirk, the hidden shirk in actions, uh, such as the prayer, as we explained earlier, where one will elongate his ruku', elongate his sujood, elongate his prayer because of the others observing him, and of course doing this for the sake of pleasing them as well. So, these are some, and there are more. Each one of us knows his own. Maybe some of us are suffering from this kind of disease on our own, and that example was not mentioned here. It doesn't mean that it is not included. Each one of us knows best about himself or herself. So if we have any other example which was not mentioned, that we know that we are suffering from, then we need to be aware of the consequences which I will mention now. Hopefully we will leave it alone for the sake of Allah. Consequence number one of having this kind of shirk is entering Jahannam wal Billah. Entering the hellfire. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hud, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتَهَا نُوَفِّي إِلَيْهِمْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فِيهَا وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يُبْخَسُونَ Whoever seeks the life of this world and its glitter and its adornment, then we shall verily pay them their full wages therein and they will not be deprived of anything. Then Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا النَّارِ وَحَبِطَ عَنْهُمْ مَا صَنَعُوا فِيهَا وَبَاطِلٌ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ it is those who will have nothing in the hereafter but the hellfire. And vain were their deeds that they performed in this life, and worthless were the actions that they used to do. It will all be, as they say, down the drain. It will not remain on surface, so one may benefit, it will go away. Who? Those who seek the glitter of the dunya. We want the titles of the dunya. Sheikh X, Dr. Sheikh. X, it becomes an issue of titles, who I studied under, and who is my sheikh, and who is my so on and so forth. If the intentions are ill, not for the sake of Allah, if it's a popularity uh, contest, where we're trying to be more popular, more famous, then this is, this is included in this ayah. These are people who are seeking the dunya, fine, Allah says we will give them the full wages. You want to be famous? You shall become famous. But then on the day of judgment, Allah says they will have nothing, but the hellfire will ayyadu billah. So this is a, a choice that we all have to make. Insha'Allah we will make the right choice. Secondly, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will abandon this person. Per the narration we quoted earlier. Allah says at the end of the hadith, Taraktuhu wa shirkah. I will abandon him and his shirk. And if Allah abandons one of us, then no one will take us afterwards. Except who? Shaitan. If Allah abandons us, then the shaitan will pick us up. And if he picks us up, where are we going? Jahannam. So it's the same destination. So we cannot afford to do this. We must be mindful of Allah every single time we're involved in any act of worship. Whether it is restricted to oneself or it involves others. Whether it is da'wah to others or acts of worship, acts of, worship of our own. Sincerity is a fundamental condition. Thirdly, this person will be increased in misguidance. When Allah described the munafiqeen, what did he say? يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ Allah says concerning the munafiqeen, they try to deceive Allah. Crazy people trying to deceive who? Allah, the one who knows the secret. And those who believe, they try to deceive them as well. But they are only deceiving themselves while they perceive it not. They are not aware of the fact that they are, they are deceiving themselves in their process. Then Allah says, why? In their hearts is a disease. So Allah says, then Allah will increase them with the disease, more of that disease. And they will have a severe punishment prepared for, prepared for them because of their lies. Because of when they used to lie in this dunya to Allah, lie to the believers, and lying against themselves. This is equality of who? Munafiqeen. And I saw once a video that someone sent to me, 
of a Rafidi. You know the Rafidi, the Shia. May Allah treat them the way they deserve to be treated. They were having the camera moving around in the masjid, right? And the man was sitting there with nothing wrong with him, right? He was sitting there smiling. As soon as he saw the camera, he went like this. <laughs> he started crying. You think I'm joking? Wallahi, the man was all right. As soon as he saw the camera, he started crying. Meaning, he wants to appear in front of the camera that he was, he was affected by the speaker, whoever that Shi'i was cursing the Sahaba on the minbar that they have. They still feel khushu' by the way, in that process of cursing the Sahaba, these people. Still he wanted to claim that he is what? He fears Allah. That he's crying for the sake of Allah. When? When the camera came around. This is what it is. We, when we do these things, we are resembling these kinds of individuals. Al-Munafiqeen, Al-Rafida, and others. And this is not befitting for a believer. Not befitting to resemble because if we resemble them, then we are on their footsteps. And if we are on their footsteps, then we will be going after them to the same destination that they have. You will notice everything will lead to Jahannam. Every one of the consequences eventually will lead to Jahannam. Tayyib, we need to pause. Let's break it down. Because there may be some misunderstanding. Now I'm giving you a lecture, right? When I came here, my intention is supposed to be what? For the sake of Allah. The of Allah right? Now there's a shaitan working on me as he's working on everybody else. He will work in the process to make me change my intention. So the ulama broke this down. They said if one begins his act of worship for the sake of Allah, you follow me? Then the shaitan starts whispering to him in the, in, within the act while he's performing this act. He realizes that and then he fights that off. He doesn't go for it. That does not affect his deed. Alhamdulillah. That does not affect the deed if he fights it off. If it enters while he's doing the act of worship and he does not fight it off, rather he becomes satisfied with it. Then the ulama have differed. Some of them said it is alright because initially his intention was, was for the sake of Allah. Whereas the others said that has been ruined with that new intention because he did not fight it off. And the most popular opinion among, opinion among the ulama is that that deed will be void. And the person will attain Allah's wrath, Allah's anger, wal-iyadu billah. Tayyib. You follow me? So then, pure riya, pure riya, where strictly for the sake of the people, this is, Allah will not accept that. Sincerity in the beginning, then change of intention in the process. If we continue, if we fight it off, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, we always remind, this is for the sake of Allah, Allah is watching me. Allah hears me, Allah sees me, Allah knows what's in my heart. Hey, you talk to yourself. What are you doing? Don't be fooled by the hype. Don't go after the people. You have to talk to yourself as a da'iyah or anything else. And anytime you're involved in da'wah, whether a lecture or otherwise, same thing happens, right? So we have to always remind ourselves. If we don't fight it off and we enjoy it, say this is nice, and we stick like to, with that particular intention till the end, then we have wasted that deed, according to most of the ulama. So then we are only successful when we keep it for the sake of Allah. And if ever an, a bad intention occurs, then we fight it off immediately without any delay or hesitation. Tayyib, this was the disease. What about the cure? You know, if we give the disease without a cure, then we are making, you know, the, I will just depress myself in you. Right? We leave here with more of a headache than anything because we say, okay, maybe I have these problems and what's the solution? The solution is first and foremost, knowledge. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Verily, only those who truly fear Allah among His servants are the scholars. So the more you have knowledge of Allah, the more you'll be able to know the greatness of Allah, the more you know the greatness of Allah, the more you'll understand the unimportance of everybody else. And so that will help us. Secondly, uh, the second means uh, is the, that I would like to mention to you is re remembering the life of this world and the life to come. That our ultimate destination as we dealt with in the previous lectures is Jannah. And Jannah can be attained 
with Tawheed. And Tawheed must be sincere and pure for the sake of Allah. So any, anything that may affect this Tawheed of ours, we need to eliminate it from our lives. We need to get rid of it immediately. And that is if you remember the life to come, then you'll be able to do the job. Thirdly, let's get some advice from the Salaf. Who are the Salaf? Sahaba, Tabi'een, wa Atba'a Tabi'een. And whoever followed them on their footsteps, on their righteous path, until today, until the day of judgment. Anyone who follows the way of the Salaf, I'm not talking about any sects or any grouping or any uh, fractions among the Muslims. I'm talking about the way, the methodology of as salafu salih right? Uh, this is what I'm calling to, a way, a methodology, nothing else as far as I'm concerned. I don't know about everybody else in the world, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm not calling anyone to any group. I'm calling us to a way, an understanding of the deen. How do you live Islam? Not according to Mawlana X or Ammo B. According to the Sahaba and the Atba' al-Tabi'een and Atba' al-Tabi'een including the four Imams and others. Whoever was correct among them until this day. So this is a way of life that has been established by so many individuals that were rightly guided that you can never go wrong if you follow their way. You may, we may make mistakes in fiqh issues, but if we're following the grounds and the establishments of the Sahaba in terms of the usul, then we are okay. The difference of fiqh issues does not take us out of that. It doesn't mean that we all pray exactly the same way. Right? We all stand in salah and it's exactly the same because you may follow an opinion which mentions that after the rukur you put your hands on your chest and another one says that you keep them down. Both is from the way of the righteous predecessors per the understanding of the textual evidence. Right? So we're not going to become replicas of one another and it doesn't mean that we will never disagree. However, we all have a common understanding of Islam which is the way of these early generations that were praised by Allah. Praised by the Prophet ﷺ is the way that will take us back to the honor that they had. This is common sense. It doesn't take a philosopher. We've dealt with this in previous lectures. It's called the righteous predecessors where we explain that the, the way of the righteous predecessors is the only way that will revive Islam and the only way that will guarantee is Jannah. That is the way that we are calling to bi-idhnillahi azza wa jal. So what did the Salaf say concerning that? Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad rahimahullah ta'ala used to say doing an action for the sake of people is shirk and avoiding doing an action, not doing it for the sake of people is riya sincerity is that Allah saves you from both and we will deal with that the mistake of people leaving alone good deeds because now I'm afraid of shirk so come give a lecture if you qualified come give da'wah Say, Akhi, wallah, I think I, my intentions are not sound. Ma'lish, I don't want to give da'wah anymore until I fix myself. Huh? Or I will no longer do these voluntary acts of worship because I don't think I'm sincere. This is from the other tricks of the shaitan. He wants us to abandon good deeds and righteousness. So he says, you're not sincere, leave it alone for the sincere people. That's a big no-no. Rather, you have to do this deed and you strive, you struggle, you, you work with yourself to be sincere for the sake of Allah. The deed is not abandoned. So this is why he said, leaving it alone for the sake of people is riya. Because you're still doing it for the people. You're leaving alone is for the people. We're falling into the same hole, which is having others in mind with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This should never be the case. Uh, Ya'qub al-Makfuf used to say, the sincere person is the one who hides his good deeds the same way he hides his bad deeds. And let's measure ourselves according to this yardstick. If you want to hide your good deeds, the same way you like to ha hide your bad deeds, you're sincere. If we like to hide our bad deeds, because we have them, but we don't mind people seeing our good deeds, we're not sincere. Dangerous, indeed. Abu Uthman used to say, sincerity is forgetting the, si forgetting the sight of the creation and continually being mindful of Allah. Continually observing Allah. This is what it means. And some of the ulama said, if you want to remove يعني, shirk from your life, riya from your life, then consider the opinion of the human beings like that of the animals. Consider the opinion of people 
Not that the people are animals. Their opinion is equal to that of the animals, meaning it doesn't benefit you or harm you. What a cow thinks about you, right? What matters is what Allah thinks about you. So if you look at the people in this fashion, you don't have to worry about it. I don't care what they think. You know, I don't care whether they like my ibadah or they don't. I don't care whether they see me. I, in fact, I don't want them to see me. And I don't want them to know what I do on my own. I don't want them to know I did Umrah. I don't want them to know I did Hajj. I don't want them to know I did I'tikaf. Nowadays, it's the other way around. Brother, I'm doing I'tikaf. Brother, don't tell me. If your I'tikaf is for the sake of Allah, and I'm not working with you, so I will inform the manager, why are you telling me what you're doing? This is not the way of the Salaf. Some of them will be reading the Quran in the masjid, and somebody will walk in, and he will hide it in the stove. They don't want someone to see them read the Quran. Others, he will be sleeping next to his wife, and his pillow will be soaked with tears, and his wife doesn't know. Another one will wait for his wife to go to sleep, his wife, and he will sneak out of the bed to do Qiyam, his wife doesn't know. One of them was continued to fast, voluntary fast for 20 years. His wife will give him breakfast in the morning, he will go give it as a sadaqah, lunch. He will go to work, give it as a sadaqah, come home around Maghrib time, and he eats, his wife thinks this is his dinner. He's fasting. His wife doesn't know. I mean, these were the people. What about me and you? It's the other way around. Not only we're not that good, but we are the opposite way. And this is the, as the ulama say, the difference between the later generations and the early generations. They had sincerity, akhi, and ukhti. They had it for the sake of Allah. They didn't care about the dunya. We are on the opposite side of the coin. We love the dunya so much that there's barely any room for sincerity. But... It doesn't mean it's not attainable. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It is. They are sincere individuals today. Many of the ulama and the students of knowledge and the common people are sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is attainable, but we have to be knowledgeable of it and we have to strive accordingly. Ibrahim ibn al-Adham used to say, he has not been truthful to Allah, the one who seeks fame and recognition. Not truthful to Allah. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak used to say, Maybe a small deed will become big because of the niyyah, the intention. And a big deed will become small because of the niyyah. Meaning small deed that is for the sake of Allah, one riyal, for the sake of Allah, could save someone from Jahannam and permit him in Jannah. And 10,000 riyals may take him to Jahannam. Because when he gave it away, he was trying to have the people say, Hey, I am rich. And we know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about the first three who will be entering the hellfire. The first three types of people is the Mujahid and the Alim and the Qari' and the Mutasaddiq. And the Hadith of Sahih in Muslim, in Muslim that uh, uh, th this person will be brought so he may be judged. And Allah Azza wa Jal will remind him of his favors upon him. Allah will remind him of his favors upon him. He will admit them. Then Allah will say, what did you do? He, say, he will say the Mujahid, Oh Allah, I fought in your cause until I was killed. And it will be said to him, You lied. You fought, so the people will say that you were brave. And indeed, they said that you were brave. Then he will be dragged on his face to the hellfire. The second one on the list is Talib al-Ilm wa Qari al-Quran. The one who used to seek knowledge and the one who used to recite the Quran. It will be said, Allah will remind him of his favors upon him. He will admit. Then he will say, what have you done with them? He will say, oh Allah, I learned the knowledge and I taught it for your sake. I recited the Quran and taught it for your sake. It will be said to him, you lied. Rather, you taught knowledge so people will say that you are knowledgeable. And you recited the Quran so they will say that you are a qari. And they said that you were a qari and knowledgeable. Then he will be dragged on his face to Jahannam. And the last one is the one with the sabaka. Same thing. He will say he gave it for the sake of Allah. It will be said you lied. You gave it for the people to say, MashaAllah, very generous brother. And he will be dragged on his face to Jahannam. The first people that will enter Jahannam will be the Mujahid and the Alim and the Qari of the Quran, the Mutasaddiq. That shows you what, how serious this affair is. But we almost never discuss it, right? It's like we're living in La La Land, as they say. Everything is good, yalla, we just have fun, ibad, and everything. But we don't focus on this issue which may destroy everything we're doing. Right? So inshallah, Allah blessed us with this opportunity as a speaker and as audience to deal with this issue. Perhaps we will, you know, fix our situation before it's too late. And maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on us and we will enter Jannah accordingly. 
Sheikh Al-Albani, the famous muhaddith, rahmatullahi alayhi, and he became very famous. He used to say, uh, fame will break one's back. Becoming famous will break your back, meaning it's a heavy burden. It will destroy you. Because, you know, per a person, once he's famous, then the shaitan will have more access to him. He will always whisper to him, you're special. You're special, right? So there's a lot of struggle for those who are out there, the ulama who are out there. Uh, we're nothing. All of us here, we're, nobody knows us, alhamdulillah. But the ulama, those who have books authored and, you know, their knowledge goes beyond all around the world. These individuals, you know, it's difficult for them. As Sheikh Al-Bani said, it will break their backs. But usually because they are so knowledgeable of Allah, they are sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us follow their footsteps. Sahal ibn Abdullah used to say, there's nothing tougher upon the person than his niyyah. Right? Every, he said, every time, there's nothing harder for me than my niyyah. Every time I try to extinguish it in my heart, it seems to grow in another form. Right? I try to stop it from here, it comes in another way. And Sufyan uh, al thawri used to say, I have not struggled against anything more difficult than my niyyah. Verily, it keeps changing upon me. This is uh, Sufyan al thawri one of the big ulama. Actually, he's a, the one who has a madhab that did not become as popular as the other madhahib. Right? The madhahib were not only four. They were more. But these ones, Allah decreed that they will be more popular among the Muslims. These are great ulama. This is a great alim. Telling you there's nothing more difficult for me than my niyyah. Subhanallah. So what about me and you? I'm not making this impossible, brothers and sisters. We're just trying to recognize that when we strive, we will be okay. If we strive, as long as we are striving, Allah will never disappoint us because of His mercy, because of His promise. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who strive in our cause, we shall guide them to the paths. Promise from Allah. So we need to strive. The intent is, don't despair. Huh? Say, I'm never going to be this mukhlis. But strive. We strive. And if we continue to strive until we meet Allah, then inshallah we will be in a good, in a good situation. Final reminders before we conclude. A dua from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is a cure for this very disease. You must memorize this. I don't care if you don't know Arabic, you learn just this hadith. Of course, you should learn the Fatiha, you should know the Fatiha. We want you to learn Arabic more than just for this hadith. Arabic is a fundamental tool towards Islam, right? Since you're living in this country, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and if it's feasible for you, if Allah gave you some opportunity, somehow, some way, to learn even 20% of the language, don't deprive yourself of that benefit. Allah revealed the Quran and the Sunnah in the Arabic language. So it is important in the sight of Allah. Otherwise, it could have been in Hebrew or any other language. So we should strive. And having knowledge of the language will help you in the affairs of the deen. So this hadith here, where the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bik ma la a'lam ma a'lam wa astaghfiruka li ma la a'lam. O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you that I shall ascribe punishment to you without knowingly, عفوا, knowingly. And I seek your forgiveness for that which I do unknowingly. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lam. I seek refuge with you that I commit shirk knowingly. Wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. And I seek forgiveness from you for that which I do not know. This the Prophet sallallahu gave to the Sahaba as a medicine for a riya. For the riya. So we say this abundantly in our sujood before the taslim. During the last third of the night, whenever you are making dua, this is one of the dua that we should be consistent with. Okay? And lastly, uh, I would like to describe the qualities of the believers which Allah described in Surah Al-Mu'minun. And this will be a means of remind, a reminder, inshallah, for it serves as a reminder for myself and for you. Allah says concerning His righteous service, righteous, righteous servants, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ Verily, those who are in constant awe due to the fear of Allah, they're always in a state of fear, always mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ And those who believe in the ayat, signs, proofs, evidences, and verses of their Lord. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ لَا يُشْرِكُونَ And those who associate none in worship with their Lord. 
والذين يؤتون ما آتوا وقلوبهم وجلة أنهم إلى ربهم راجعون and those who bring forth the deeds that they bring forth they give it while they give it while their hearts are trembling out of fear that they are certain they will return to Allah for reckoning Aisha radiallahu anha said O oh, Messenger of Allah is this the description of the fornicator the alcoholic the thief he said ya, la ya bintu siddiq no O oh, daughter of the siddiq rather it is the believer who, ha who brings forth salah and siyam and sadaqah, but he is not sure whether Allah accepted his deeds. This is what is this ayah is describing. Meaning for us to be sincere, you, we could not feel, we cannot feel that we are already on the path. There must be this element of what? Fear of Allah. Trembleness. Is this, is this, is this deed accepted? We beg Allah for the acceptance of the deed after the deed. We don't feel that we have accomplished anything great. Because the deed may not be accepted. So Allah described them in this fashion. Then Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَهَا سَابِقُونَ It is those who, are, who haste to do the good deeds and they will be the forerunners. It is these individuals whom Allah will bless and will permit to paradise without any accountability. So, last but not least, brothers and sisters in Islam, ultimately, shirk is a major sin. Whether it is major shirk, which will take us outside of the boundaries of Islam, thus we are no longer Muslims and disqualified from heaven altogether, or minor shirk, the hidden or the apparent or the hidden, also is a great sin in the sight of Allah. And if we don't cure it, if we don't do what Allah told us about Ibrahim, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On the day where no wealth or children will be of any benefit except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. If we don't get this sound heart before we meet Allah, then we may enter Jahannam because of lack of sincerity. So from this night on, every time one of us wants to engage in an act of worship, whether it is restricted to yourself or it involves others, remember Allah. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot about Allah, then Allah made them forget about themselves. They don't know why they're doing the deeds anymore. Remember Allah. This is for the sake of Allah. This is to please Allah. And no one with Allah. Allah alone. And no one with Allah. If the shaitan whispers otherwise, at some point, we fight it off. Don't entertain that thought. This is the way to success. And ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant myself and you the way to success and to make us among the righteous servants who when they hear the reminder, they follow the best of it. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Uh, one of the brothers, may Allah reward him with goodness. He was meant, ahlain. He was mentioning that, uh, uh, the, to mention the whole dua. Uh, the whole actually narration which includes this dua. Uh, and I, I, frankly, uh, being sincere, inshallah, I, I did not remember this. When I, when I found this dua, I found only the portion that I knew, not the one that he mentioned, even though I have heard it before, which is the fact that shirk is more secretive in my ummah than the, uh, than the movement of an ant on a stone. You know how gentle and subtle that is? It's more subtle than an ant walking on a stone among my ummah. So this is how dangerous shirk is and commonly spread. Is that it? It says here, uh, sometimes we need to show up for the sake of Islam, such as list our qualifications or achievements before we deliver a lecture, or share our experiences in da'wah with our fellow da'is in order to benefit from each other's experience, but there's such a fine, thin line between the cor correct and wrong intention. Barakallah uh, feek. When people praise us, we also feel happy. Or sometimes you might mention a good a deed to our parents or teachers, sheikhs, to make them happy and content about our progress. What about these situations? Well, each one of these, again, we have to look at it on case by case. It's situational. It depends on the individual. Again, I mentioned many of the things I, I enumerated in this lecture, which are usually, you know, which may be shirk, can also be sincerity, depending on the person. So we just mentioned the most common way they are expressed. 
However, uh, with this mentioned, let me just go one by one. Mentioning the qualifications and achievements, sometimes this is a must, right? And again, if you, but if we're looking for praise, then we are in a danger zone. Because one of the Salaf, as we mentioned, said he is not sincere to Allah, the one who seeks fame and recognition. So if you want to be recognized by the people to admire you, then you are failing. If you are mentioning them because you have no choice, right? They need the qualifications. So you mention them, alhamdulillah. We know from the ulama, alim, with the ultimate meaning of the word. I mean, someone who has the deen understood from A to Z, right? Of course, there's more room for knowledge. When he was asked about himself, he couldn't speak about himself. All he did is praise Allah, alhamdulillah. All he did was praise Allah as if he is an ant. Even though Allah knows he struggled for the sake of Allah to become this knowledgeable person. So he, the knowledgeable person does not see himself as knowledgeable. That's the thing. If we believe we're knowledgeable, we're ignorant. Because we still have a long way to go. So this depends on the intention. Uh, mentioning a good deed to, to please the parents... You know, Allahu Alam, I will not be able to, because this is so, so technical, so, so subtle. I cannot really give you any, uh, an answer, because any answer may mislead someone. If I say, Mafi Mushkila, then some people will continue to do it until the shaitan make him commit shirk. And if I say this is shirk, and, and it may be someone is sincere, they stop doing it. So I say, each one of us evaluates him or herself. The ultimate intention should be pleasing Allah, right? Whatever you have to do, you have to do as long as your intention is to please Allah. This is what the ulama mentioned, this is what I can convey to you. How about, uh, how about people like depend on luck? This is also shirk? Is it minor or major shirk? It, it, like we mentioned before, if they believe that, you know, uh, number 13 controls this world and will ultimately bring evil, then this is major shirk, right? If they believe that Allah had made the number 13 means of, of evil, then this is minor shirk. But ultimately luck, you know, lucky and unlucky and lucky 7, unlucky 13, this is all un-Islamic. Horoscopes, un-Islamic. You know, seeing a black cat and then assuming that, you know, someone's going to die, dropping the salt, opening an umbrella in the house. People have some crazy things, right? Uh, that they mean, th some mean different things. Uh, all this is un-Islamic. Uh, we don't have any of that. It may constitute major shirk or it may constitute minor shirk depending on the person's understanding of that uh, factor. Some people after buying a house or starting a business, they get an imam to come and read dua to start off the business. Uh, blessing. Is this blessing from the sunnah? No, it is not from the sunnah. You know, uh, the most sincere dua is the dua of the person to himself. You know, for your own business, if you want Allah to bless it, for Allah to give you, so you can conduct business properly, you don't depend on an imam. If an imam, your neighbor, happens to visit you, and you say, make dua because you believe he's righteous, then this was narrated from the righteous predecessors, that they used to do this, but that was not their habit. They did not depend on someone's dua. It was a bonus. If they got it, alhamdulillah, if not, ma fi mushkila. But to bring an imam out of the way and bring him to the business so he can stand there and make dua and everybody says ameen with him, then we don't know. I've never come, I have never come across, maybe someone else has, anything from the sunnah or from the actions of our righteous predecessors that suggests that this action should be done or that th this is in agreement with the sunnah. Uh, does bid'ah hasana exist in Islam? Some people use this term to introduce new acts of worship, not from the sunnah. Did Umar anhu do a bid'ah hasana? Example, uh, 20 rak'ah for taraweeh, mashallah. This is a lecture. There's no bid'ah hasana. This is why we need Arabic. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to say, "وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا وَكُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٌ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٌ." Every innovation will lead astray. It cannot be any more basic than that in any language. كُلُّ كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانٍ Everyone upon this earth will perish. Kullu means everyone, no exception. Kullu bid'atin dalala. Every innovation will lead astray. Does someone have the nerve after the Prophet tells tell us that every innovation come and make some further, further uh, categorizing of bid'ah? A'udhu billah. So there's no such thing as bid'ah hasana. You either worship Allah according to the sunnah 
or you are worshipping Allah according to your desires and Allah will not accept the deed. Is that clear? Beautiful. Umar never prayed 20 rak'at. And I challenge anyone to produce a single authentic narration. A single authentic narration that proves that Umar ever prayed 20 rak'at or commanded Ubay ibn Ka'ib to lead the people with 20 rak'at. You will find this quoted in books, but it is inauthentic narrations. Sheikh Al-Albani has a book called Salatu Tarawih, where he and he is a alim of hadith. And so they say, Ahlu Makkah adra bi shi'abiha. The people of Mecca know best about their aisles and, and the streets. Meaning, the, you know, you know, you, the carpenter knows how to do his business more than the interior designer. He is a alim of hadith. He made an intricate study of these narrations. Brothers and sisters, not even one is sahih. Not even hasan. Not even good. Which is a, a degree below sahih. So there's no 20 rak'at. There's 11 rak'at or 13 depending on the hadith of Ibn Abbas or Aisha. And the 13 is because including the rak'atayn of uh, the sunnah after Isha. So the sunnah after Isha with the 11 of Qiyam, that's 13. Khalas. Case closed. No 20. You say the haram. You say, but Mecca, but Medina, but brother, but the Imam. But we say, listen, there's a lot of buts in the world and we don't care about that. Our main goal is the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We love all of the ulama who were upon the sunnah and we know that they're not angels who are infallible. They made mistakes. It doesn't mean that I don't respect Imam X if he said that I should pray 20. It just means that I don't agree with him because I'm in agreement with the sunnah before I agree with a human being who's teaching me the sunnah. You follow me? We have a sahih hadith. Aisha said he never prayed more than 11, not in Ramadan and not outside Ramadan. Khalas. In terms of Umar uh, doing a bid'ah hasana, he didn't do a bid'ah hasana. Who established Qiyam in Ramadan? The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He led them for two nights, according to another nation, three nights in a row. On the fourth night, he, they all gathered in the masjid. He did not come out. Then he told them later on, it, it was not unknown to me that you were outside. But I was afraid that it will become obligatory upon you. And you will not be able to fulfill that obligation. So he did not do Qiyam every night in Taraweeh, in Ramadan. Because Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi as mercy to the Ummah, he was afraid that it will become wajib to do Taraweeh. And people will not be able to carry it out. So he left it alone. After he died, Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi is it possible that revelation will come? No. Revelation stops. So then it can never become an obligation. It remains a Sunnah. Umar revived the Sunnah. Clear? This is the most logical explanation. If anyone disputes with that, then this is just, يعني, this is following the desires. Wallahu alam. Because the ulama have explained it so adequately that, يعني, alhamdulillah, it makes sense to any human being. A. Is it permissible to give charity food to people at the death anniversary? Anniversary of a family member. Like they do some countries from the subcontinent. Oh, yeah. That's not only the subcontinent, come to the Middle East and see what you will see. We have the three days and the seven days and the 40 days and the year and I don't know what else, a century maybe if they again do that. You know like who? Like the Fara'ina. This is the Fir'aun and his people who established this way. It was picked up by the Christians and it moved on to the Muslims. There's no such thing in Islam. Anniversary of the dead. There's no three days, as many people think. And there's no gathering in the house of the deceased where they make kahwa and shai for you. So you can come spend a few hours, they hire a qari who comes and makes a few thousand riyals to read some Quran. And then people have a bunch of dinners and lunches and so on and so forth for three days and then everybody goes home. Wallah, we have given farewell to our dead. These are innovations. Innovations, you're shocked. Saying this brother, man, where did they get him from? Right? Everything we do is wrong. La. But we are living in a time where the sunnah has become hidden. People don't know the sunnah. And what is popular in our countries are innovations. So my speech is shocking to you. It was shocking to me in the beginning. I was in the same shoes. Until you read the material, say, Akhi, wallah, I, it looks like the sunnah is clear. So where are we doing these things from? Where did we get these habits and customs from? It's from the non-Muslims. So then, it's a bid'ah. 
to gather in the house of the deceased what you, they used to do. The Prophet ﷺ, when Ja'far who died, he said, bring food, bring food to Al Ja'far. Because they have been afflicted with something that will preoccupy them from cooking food. Nowadays, you call a restaurant, you bring the food. Back then, there was no restaurant. If someone died and they needed to eat, some woman, somebody had to go and make, maybe slaughter an animal and so on and so forth. So this was difficult for them. The Prophet ﷺ said, make food for them. So the sunnah is that you make food and you drop it off. Not to sit there. Not to go sit on a chair, on a bunch of chairs that they make for you. No. You go there, when you see the family of the deceased, they don't stand in row where you shake hands. I'm telling you, these are all innovations done even here. Shake hands one with one. And you so, عَظَّمَ اللَّهُ أَجْرَكُ وَغَفَرَ لِمَيِّتِكُ Not from the sunnah. What is the sunnah? لِلَّهِ مَا أَخَذْ وَلَهُ مَا أَعْطَى وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى فَاصْبِرْ وَاحْتَصِبْ وَاحْتَصِبْ Verily to Allah belongs what He gave and to Allah belongs what He took back. And everything with Allah is in fixed terms. So be patient and seek Allah's reward. You may say this the day the person dies, a week later, a month later, a year later, whenever you see him. But the ulama say, like Shaykh Albani rahimahullah, you look into the circumstances. If the person seems to have forgotten about the death, you don't remind him. If he looks, khalas, he's alright, you don't remind him because the objective of the condolences is to ease pain. So it is like a medicine. If the baby is good, you don't keep giving him cough medicine until he starts coughing again from the cough medicine. If he's cure, cured, alhamdulillah. So this, this condolence is situational with the circumstance of the person. Not associated with three days. There's no death anniversary. And going there is an innovation. Participating is an innovation. And taking food is an innovation as well. And Allah will not accept these deeds. Allah will not accept them. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ Whosoever does an action that is not in agreement with this affair of ours will have it rejected. Allah will reject it. So this will be of no benefit. Uh, some people hang Quranic ayahs in their room. Uh -huh. That's what I forgot. To prevent the shaitan or evil coming, uh, is this okay? Uh, what can we do to protect our home from evil? Yeah, uh, hang you know, some of the buses, right? If you go on hajj, if you ever go on hajj, this is what we heard from people who went on hajj. The, some of the brothers from Turkey, you know, uh, their, their bus has, يعني, يعني, what, what do I call it? All sorts of things, right? All sorts of things. And this is very common. Some people have what they call al ayn al zarqa, right? The blue eye. They call it evil eye. Right, right. Well, in my country, they call it the blue eye, right? And that blue eye is supposed to protect you from the evil eye. Right, so they have, they hang a blue eye, you know, very strange, like made of some sort of stone, right? Or people put ayatul kursi or qul huwa Allahu ahad and so on and so forth. All this falls under amulets. This falls under hanging amulets. This will not protect you, rather this will be a proof against you. How often do people hang these things on their walls and people smoking in the house, watching naked women on TV and above them is Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. والله، this is dangerous. It's funny, but it's crazy, because the people are belittling Allah's speech, watching TV, music in the house, and والله آيات all over the house. So the people have turned it into what decoration. So we got you know nice Mecca door. You know they have now a Mecca door in a frame, right? So you every time you go to your house, there's the Kaaba in front of you. I'm not Mecca. I'm sorry, the Kaaba, right? With the open. So the house becomes, you know, uh, just like, like churches. We're trying to decorate it with the speech of Allah, but we're not living the speech of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ had nothing hung on his wall, right, of this fashion. People knew how to write. They could have written some ayat and hung them on the wall or in the masajid. This was never done. The masjid didn't have, you know, uh, Allah nur samawat al ard going all around the masjid, you know. We're just extra spending. You know how much these things cost? Maybe 30,000 riyals. If they were to give it to some needy Muslims, wallah, it would have been better. But people now adorn the masajid, even though we were warned against that. So this is just shows you the state of the ummah today. That's why we need to learn, we need to practice, we need to change our affairs. Uh, so then hanging these things on the wall will not benefit the house. How do you protect your house from evil? By you reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. You recite Surah Al-Baqarah. You remembering Allah upon entering the house, giving the salam, 
Prophet said when the person enters his house and he gives salam to his family, what does the shaitan say? Come on, let's go. We can't stay in this house. You see? When you want to eat, you say, Bismillah. He says, come on, we can eat with these people. But when you enter into the house, you know, talking about, where's the food? And the shaitan is going to eat with you. He will remain in the house. Secondly, you want to protect your house from evil. Take down these pictures. Grandpa doesn't have to be on your wall. Your graduation pictures don't have to be on your wall. Because the angels will not enter a house which has a picture. And if the angels are not there, the shayateen will be there. So there will be conflicts in the household. You may think this is extreme. No, this is the deen. People are extreme in negligence concerning the deen. People don't care. Islam is a side factor in our, in our lives. Whatever part is suitable for us, salah, sayyam, ma fi mushkila, this is practical. But the other things, ya akhi, make life difficult, then this is not for me. This is for someone else. This is the problem with the individual, not with the teachings of Islam. So this is how you keep the shayateen out of your house, wallahu alam. Uh, can a husband and wife do deeds together to help uh, each other? Or is it better to do it alone in fear of riya? Well, we have a hadith where Prophet ﷺ said, Rahimallahu mri'in, may Allah have mercy on a man who wakes up to pray at night, and then he wakes up his wife, and if she doesn't wake up, he sprinkles water on her. And it doesn't mean he gets a bucket, you know, and he pours it on her, because not only she will wake up, she will wake up and she will do a lot more than waking up. And the other way around. So you can't be funny with these things, right? Especially when people are sleepy. Sprinkle some water in order to wake them up so they may pray. And Umar ibn al-Khattab used to get up at night to do his qiyam and then he would wake his family up. And he would recite the statement of Allah, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا And command your family to establish the prayer and be patient upon doing so. So a husband and wife may help one another, right? As long as the shaitan doesn't ruin their intentions as well. Where they now the husband is trying to please the wife and the wife is trying to please the husband. So if one is able to control his niyyah, then ultimately we have evidences that this used to be done by the Sahaba. But if one fears that he will enter into Riyah, then try to do it alone. Until one has enough strength to overcome this kind of uh, wicked intention. Uh, what can you say to a person who doesn't seek knowledge because he's too busy? Uh, stop being busy. Can one put up uh, the name of Allah or Muhammad Sallallahu on walls as decoration or protection? No. And another grave error that you see in the masajid and elsewhere, or they sell them as frames, it says Allah in one circle and next to it is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shirk. You're making Allah equal to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even in this sense, because what comes to mind, if I was a non-Muslim who entered into your house, and I don't read Arabic, right? Not me, A'udhu Billah. If some non-Muslim entered your house and asked you, what is this? Say, this is Allah. And what is this Muhammad? What are they going to think? Muslims worship Allah and Muhammad. Right or wrong? Unless you're going to give them a lecture. So this image is wrong. It should not, they should not, and this is from the ulama. I don't bring things from my own mind, inshallah. This is from the ulama, from the scholars. This is incorrect to have the name of Allah and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam parallel, right, equal, right, aligned with one another. Okay? If ever you have something that has both, then the name of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be beneath. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the name, even in the name, should be above. Otherwise, ultimately Allah is above. But again, avoid these, these things. We don't need these things. All these frames and these little things that have, you know, that we decorate the house with it. Decorate your house with good deeds. Decorate your house with your salah. Instead of 98% of the Muslim ummah doing the sunnah at the masjid, even though the sunnah is supposed to be done at home, go decorate your house by praying the sunnah at home for the men. But nowadays, if you don't pray the sunnah in the masjid, people think you don't pray the sunnah. And Allah knows that you are following the sunnah and they're not following the sunnah. So we have so many narrations that mention the virtue of praying the sunnah, the voluntary prayers at home. This is how you decorate your house. Then you can get some nice curtains and nice sofas. I'm not saying that's it, you know, you live on a carpet. But the ultimate way of decorating the house is with the deen of Islam, not with the ayat and the narrations and things of this nature. Because this is how people are falling into the traps of the shaitan. Uh, I believe this is in order. In, the, uh, in one famous Arab country, they use I everywhere. Whereas they have highly acclaimed scholars. They do not know shirk undercover. What a pity. Indeed, 
Uh, but again, you know, uh, scholars, you know, this the definition of scholars is, is like, again, it's not someone who wears a particular clothing and then we label him a scholar. If a scholar doesn't know shirk, then what, ki what kind of scholar is he? He's not a scholar. He's an ignorant individual who has some knowledge in some areas of the deen. Frankly, if you see someone going to the grave of someone and doing sujood to him, can you say this is a alim from the ulama of the Muslim ummah? No. This is someone who may know something about fiqh, but he does not ha he's not an alim in the ultimate sense of the word. Uh, people are already starting to get tired. Ty, what about showing off through expensive clothing, beautiful house, and other worldly things? I mean, showing achievements in life. There's nothing wrong with looking nice, having a nice, comfortable car, and having a nice looking house. When the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, he will not enter Jannah, he who has a grain of arrogance in his heart. One of the Sahaba immediately said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, one of us likes to have a nice outfit, nice thobe, nice shoes. He told him, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. Verily Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. He said arrogance is rejecting the truth and belittling people. So he acknowledged alayhi salatu salam looking good. He used to wear some of his best clothing alayhi salatu salam when he would meet the confederates and the people who would come, not the confederates, the, uh, the convoys who would come to him alayhi salatu salam. He would, uh, he would treat them with, with, you know, look nice for his guests that were coming over. So having a nice car, nice house is fine. As long as the intention again is not the people to praise you. But the intention should be what? That the people see the bounty of Allah upon you. That the people recognize Allah's favor upon you, not your favor upon them. That Allah, this is from the, this is from the bounty of Allah. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me money. I'm okay. So this is the intention. Because the Prophet ﷺ saw a man with a lousy looking garment. He told him, don't you have any money? He said, yes I do. He said, then let Allah see the, His blessings upon you. Yani wear according to your money. If you have money, dress nice. But don't make it a fashion show. And don't turn it into means of attracting the people without trying to show them the favor of Allah upon you. So again, this is very intricate. Uh, the, does that sign, this is in Arabic, ironically, does the sign on the forehead come only from Qiyamul Layl? No. It, it, the sign on the head has to do with one's skin. Some people worship Allah more than everybody else. They make, you know, Allah knows how many sujood in a day, and their forehead is, has nothing on it. And others in, in a month, new Muslims, they develop it, right? So it's an issue of skin. What the ulama mean by they say, Simahum fi wujuhihim. Their, their glowing is in their face. This is the glowing of Iman. Right? So in a man's case, he will, his face should be according to the Sunnah. According to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And then he has righteous deeds which will glow on his face. They will illuminate. And sin make the person's face darken. Not in the skin color. But it just appears in the sights of the people. So this is the alama. It is not you know, the other one around. It's be speaking about the last third of the night. What is that time? Is it one hour or two hours before Fajr? Do the calculations. Calculate from Maghrib, which is when night begins, until Fajr. Count the hours and divide them until you get the third. Whatever is the one less third, then that will be the time. It may be an hour and a half, two hours. Allahu Ta'ala Alam. ما هو موقف شيوخ العلماء؟ what is the stance of the ulama or the shuyukh who receive this kind of reputation without them seeking it or intentionally? Alhamdulillah. This is from the favor of Allah upon them. Because when uh, usually, you know, Allah will, will, will allow the caller to the truth to propagate his truth. So you find Shaykh al-Sahib ibn Taymiyyah and others became so popular. And we don't say that they were seeking the, this dunya. On the contrary, they were seeking Allah's pleasure bi Azza wa Jal. So them being popular without them seeking it is absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that, inshallah. Uh, does the person uh, pray tarawih at home due to riya and sum'ah? No. No. You pray tarawih in the masjid with the Muslims and you strive against that. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever remains with the Imam until he leaves, he will get the reward of praying all night. 
So this is more rewarding. And you don't want to detach yourself from the Muslim Ummah. You don't want to be you know, a Sufi living on the mountains on your own. We should mix with the Muslims. Uh, for those who are not upon the Sunnah, we teach them the Sunnah. If they don't want the Sunnah, then we have some barriers between us. And for those who uh, follow the Sunnah, then obviously we should mix with the, uh, the Muslims to the best of our ability. The non-Muslims, if them enter in a masjid, uh, it depends. Uh, if the intention if to, to give them da'wah, they are near to Islam, uh, then it's fine that they enter the masjid as long as the woman does not have her menstrual cycle in the woman's section. Uh, if the intention is otherwise, then they may not enter the masjid. Right? So it must be strictly for da'wah purposes. Because we have evidences that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he tied uh, uh, Uthama, Thumama, Thumama to the pole in the masjid. Right? And he observed the Muslims praying. And after three days, he went and he came back and he bore witness that none is worthy of worship but Allah. And Muhammad ﷺ is the messenger of Allah because of what he's seen from the kindness of the messenger of Allah. So the point being, he allowed him to stay in the masjid. Uh, the Christians, when they came to uh, debate with the Prophet ﷺ, have a dialogue concerning the divinity of Jesus, they also entered the masjid. Right? So we have evidences of them coming, but there must, have, there must be a noble objective behind that. Uh, before offering a tahajjud, I believe, is it necessary to take a nap and then offer tahajjud prayer? No, this is a very common misconception. I've, I've been asked this so many times. People think that tahajjud cannot be done unless one sleeps first. No. Tahajjud begins after Isha. The best time is the last third of the night in terms of virtue. But in essence, once Isha has entered, then this is the time of Witr. And Witr can be prayed from after Isha until Fajr. So there's no yani, uh, commandment that you should sleep first before you rise or wake up again and pray. Rather, you may pray immediately. But if you want the best reward, it's the last third of the night. Sleeping or not sleeping before does not make any difference as far as I know. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Suppose a person in the office sitting completely without doing work and... Uh, his manager comes out, comes and it starts surrendering work. Is it considered as a shikha? Wallahi, this is... I don't think anyone here is, ex is excluded from this. Allah musta'an. Yeah, this is a tough one, right? When the boss is around, we are the ideal employees. And when he's gone, we're drinking tea. That's just the way it works, right? Allah musta'an. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's okay. Uh, yes, this is a problem. This is a problem. This is a form of shirk. Because a Muslim should be sincere in his deen and his work. Work is a form of worship if the intention is there. And so if we're working only, if we're only sincere in our work when the boss is there and when he's not and Allah is seeing we're not sincere, then we are indeed in trouble. This is a form of riya. Okay, so we should all avoid that strictly inshallah. Like having a keychain I purchased from Turkey which has the blue pigment. I have no intention that it will protect me or something. It's just a souvenir item. Is the, can we associate the intention with, with our act? Absolutely. I mean, if somebody got this blue eye because he thought it looked nice and he didn't know that according to the people this is means of protection from the hasad or evil eye or envy, then ultimately this person, Allah will not hold, hold him accountable for something which he did not know. So the intention plays a role. However, once he's advised... Yeah, I'm, I'm aware. This is, they use it for... For, for, uh, hey, then no. I understand your question now. No. Even if your intention are good. For example, if we open this door, here's what happens. Let me go to the Christmas party. I mean, I really don't believe in Christmas. But I mean, there's good cake. You know, maybe I'll have some fun. So I'll go. And then New Year's, then birthdays, then, you know, the whole thing will be washed away. Thinking that my intention is separate than everybody else's. So no, this is, is a no-no, Akhi. Uh, intention here, even though you may not be as sinful, the fact that you are resembling these people or propagating this, because one who sees you may learn from you that this is okay, then you will gain the sins of the other people. So you're still in the same, you know, danger zone. Nah. Allahu <laughs> Subhanakallah wa bihamdik,